We did fly in yesterday afternoon from Fiji. Just had uh, 16 days uh, in the Fiji Islands. As Pastor said, we were missionaries to Fiji and the South Pacific for 23 years, back in the States 5. And one of the one of the questions that sat in my heart over these last five years really was questions about the gospel and the whole world. And by the way, before I do that, this is my wife, Wendy, and all of my family sitting in the corner. Um, and this is Anthony. By the way, Anthony's from Wenatchee. He flew down to meet us here and, and be in the conference for the Amen. week, just so you can meet. I didn't want to ignore that. Um, but a question that has sat in my mind, and I want you to ponder this all week long. Amen. There are billions of people in the world today, billions of people in the world today that will live and die and never one time hear the name Jesus. They'll never hear his name. They'll never have a presentation of the gospel. Um, if, if they were to respond to the general revelation of God, we call the general revelation of God like the universe, the stars, the, the creation. You know, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. There's no place where their voice is not heard. So if, if you were with an open and an objective heart, look up, you would, you'd have to believe in God. The only people who say there is no God are fools, according to the Bible. And, you know, so modern Western civilization is trying hard to educate their self away from belief in God. But, but only a fool could, even, only, a, only a foolish scientist could, could really look down microscopically at the wonder of uh, microscopic things and say that that could have all accidentally happened. But anywhere you go in the world, you'll find religion, no matter where you go. The most remote people, and by the way, there are today in our world, there are still remote tribes of people that have never had contact with the outside world. Yeah. They're in Sierra Leone. They are in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. You can still find people, and they have religion. They live in fear, by the way. The religions of the world uh, are very fearful religions. They're, they're fearful of curses. They're fearful of upsetting the gods. They're fearful of the afterlife. And a lot of the religious practices that they have are because they live in such fear and they don't know the freedom of Christ and salvation. And how is it possible that in our modern world today that we still have people without the gospel? And as, as Baptists, you know, we focus a lot on missions. Just about every Baptist church that I've been in has some kind of a missions program. They give some kind of money sure. to missions. They have a, a missions conference and flags will go up and boards will go up with pictures of missionaries. And so we think about missions, we talk about missions, but what I want to be very truthful with you about this morning is that we are currently in an absolutely dismal failure to reach our world. So this is not a time to pat ourselves on the back. It's a time to actually look at the scene, look what the Bible says, and ask ourselves, is this the way God intended it to be, or did God actually expect us to reach the whole world? And if God did actually expect us to reach the whole world, one, why isn't it being done? What are we missing in this equation? And what do we need to understand from the scriptures in order to get this job done? And so my, my hope is that We'll begin by laying out, it, just right here in Sunday School, I want to lay out something fantastic for you, that if you believe what I share this morning, uh, it will alter your perspective, and then uh, everything that we say after that doesn't matter if you don't believe what we talk about right here this morning. So the, the first message this morning is simply going to be called the Great Commission Mandate, and I, I understand you know what the Great Commission is. But I want to look at the Great Commission as a mandate from God. And you know what a mandate is? A mandate is when you are given a task that you have no choice in the matter. Right? When the government talked about mandates, they're saying, you don't have a choice anymore. We're telling you what to do. Um, and I'm not going to dive into any politics other than to say, in our country, we give a mandate to them. They don't give mandates to us. But anyway, Matthew chapter 28, verse number 18. See, that was it. That's the only dabble all week long. Matthew 28, 18, this, and then we'll look at Mark 16, but I want you to look at two things that were stated in these, what we call great commission verses, Matthew chapter 28, verse number 18. 
And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Okay, so this is a great commission mandate. And there are three components to it that you all know very well. Teach all nations, then baptize them, and then teach them all things. The first one is, uh, does not exclude anybody. When he said, go you therefore and teach all nations, yeah. right? That meant all nations. Yeah. We cannot baptize all nations. Right. We can only baptize those of all nations who have believed the gospel. Right. And then those that have believed the gospel and been baptized, only to that group can we teach all things. Right. All right? So all nations. Um, nations does not refer, by the way, to simply countries. When we think today about the world, we think of the, the, the world in the, in the sense of countries, but that's not how the world always existed. You know, you would have a city-state, for example. Just one city would be its own nation. Um, nations can, can refer uh, also to people groups. So, for example, within the United States of America, we have nations, right? We, we see it a lot in the, the Native American nations, the Indian reservations. They're actually nations of their own. And you would be surprised if you went to joshuaproject.net and looked up unreached people groups. We have some unreached people groups right here, even within our own country that have zero gospel witness within them. Uh, a nation would be a, dis a distinct people group separated by language, geography, and or culture and religion. And so God says, we must preach the gospel to all these nations. And then he said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. So the reason we are permitted to go to all nations is because Jesus said, in heaven and in earth, all power is given to me. That's very important because there are two different powers that exist in our sphere. There is physical power and there is spiritual power, right? So like, for example, when you read the book of Daniel and Daniel has the archangel that comes to him and said, you know, I was sent to you, but the prince of Persia stood up against me. All right, you'll find behind kingdoms, there are spiritual powers behind those kingdoms, all right, and we can look at that all through the Bible. So there, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, the rulers of darkness of this world. So as we work in the physical, there's obviously spiritual powers and forces. And Jesus, you know, they get revealed when Jesus walks on the earth, you know, because everywhere Jesus walked, you see those demonic powers um, showing up and we see that Jesus exercises power over them. Uh, there are kingdoms. When you get saved, Colossians 1 13 says you've been translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. So there is a dark kingdom that works in this world. Um, when the Bible first talks about the church in Matthew 16, 18, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So that means all the evil forces of Satan, right? They've built gates all around the world to prevent the church from bringing the gospel to those places. So there are, there are spiritual powers in every country. You get to every country, you get to every nation. Um, Fiji, where we were for 23 years as missionaries prior to its evangelism, first evangelism in the late 1800s, it was a very evil kingdom. They were, they were the world's fiercest cannibals. They had tribal warfare, ancestor worship, and they have territorial gods all over the place, and they do all kinds of, you know, dark things. And all of those uh, were a resistance. But... Here's what Jesus said. In all heaven and in all earth, all power is given to me. Right? And that word power there is the Greek word exousia, which means the authority power. Exousia is an executive authority. Right? So there are nations in the world today that make laws that say missionaries not allowed. You're not allowed to come here and preach the gospel. By the way, that happened in Paul's day. And in not only Paul's day, right there in Jerusalem, when they were preaching, Peter and John got arrested and they were told not to preach. They went back and preached. They got rearrested. And then they said, did we not straightly command you not to preach anymore in this name? 
right? So this, this is nothing new from Jerusalem all the way around all those missionary journeys. Um, which, which, uh, which nations rolled the red carpet out for the evangelism? No, Ephesus was filled with a stadium, great as Diana of the Ephesians. They were arrested and beaten at Philippi. They were let down over a, a, a basket over the wall in Damascus. I mean, you just see that both humans and evil powers have said the gospel is not allowed to come here. Yeah. But what did Jesus say? Yeah. All power is given to me. Go ye therefore. Yeah. So we need to stop looking at the world in terms of opened and closed countries, restricted and unrestricted countries. Now, I understand what it means. All right. When um, when we went into Zambia, we started going to Zambia over the last two years. You walk into immigration and they say, why are you here? And they say, we came to preach and bring Bibles. And they say, can you give me a Bible, too? All right. But if you tried to say that when you went to China, it wouldn't turn out the, the same. Right. But it doesn't matter what laws nations make. There is a power higher than them. Jesus said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. By the way, go ye therefore was a command. It was not a suggestion. It wasn't the Lord saying, hey, church, if you ever really felt burdened to do so, take the gospel to the whole world. No, he said, go ye therefore. Everybody today says, I'm just wondering if I'm called. I'm wondering if I'm called. I'm wondering if I'm called. Well, let me tell you, when it comes to the whole world, you have been commanded. Yeah. Good preacher. Every nation. Mark 16, in verse number 15, it gets clarified slightly. Mark chapter 16, in verse 15. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So Matthew says, go to all nations. Mark says, go to every creature. So what does that mean? That means you don't get to walk into a nation and preach the gospel to 10 people and say the gospel has now come to that nation. No, the Bible says within every nation, the gospel must be preached to every creature. You understand that the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And since he's not willing that any should perish, he is willing that every creature hears the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we haven't actually done the job effectively unless it's been preached to every creature. Now I'll go to Luke 24 and verse 49. Luke chapter 24 and verse number 49. Luke chapter 24, and verse number 49. Well, actually, um, let's, let's back up a, a bit. If you can just look at 45, then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it was written, thus it behooved Christ to suffer, to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name where? among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So there's that great commission. Repentance and remissions of sins should be preached amongst all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So this is interesting. In the great commission, he's already said, all power is given unto me, go ye therefore. But now he said, before you begin this journey, I want you to go to Jerusalem and I want you to wait there until you are endued with power from on high. So, but he already said all power is given to me. And now he said, I need you to wait for power. Yep. Of course, it's a different Greek word power here. It's the word dunamis. They both mean power. They're not incorrect translations. There's both power. But there is one power that speaks of my authority over you. I have power over you because of the position that I'm in. But the word dunamis power there is where we get energy. When you talk about dunamis, you're talking about energy. You're talking about ability. You're talking about strength. You're talking about miraculous power. Right? This is now ability, if you will. The Matthew 28 is the authority the power here is the ability. You need both of them, yes, by the way. 
We need the authority to go and we need the ability to go, both of them given by God. And then if you go over into Acts 1.8, where this continues, and I'm, hopefully these verses are somewhat revealed, but they just need to set the stage here. Acts 1.8, he said, but ye shall receive power. That's the dunamis power, not the exousia, not the authority was already given. He said, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall what? Ye shall be witnesses unto me where? both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost parts of the earth. So notice the scope of the Great Commission. And by the way, for the church at Jerusalem, that was also the order. It did begin at Jerusalem. And then it went to Judea and Samaria. And then it went to the uttermost parts of the earth. And they needed the dunamis power in order um, to do it. Humanly speaking, this is impossible. You, you take a, a little church in Jerusalem, as best I can tell, we know that there were 120 that remained faithful that were gathered together in the upper room. We do know that Jesus appeared to 500 brethren at once, so perhaps they were part of that. But, but, at, but at best, I've given them a 700 membership starting point to reach the whole world. But really, when you ask them um, to do that, is, this, is it even a reasonable ask? You know, you take one congregation there and you say to them, preach the gospel to every creature and all nations. Go to every nation uh, that's under heaven and preach the gospel to them. Is the completion of that actually a reasonable ask? Is it possible? And did it happen? Now, I want you to go to Colossians chapter number one. Paul had been on many missionary journeys. And when we get to this book here written to the Colossians, Paul himself, as far as we can read in his book of Acts journeys, had not personally gone to Colossae. So this had been a church. You do understand that there were far more people than Paul doing uh, missionary work? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like there were way more people than Paul doing missionary work. It's just that the, the Bible follows Paul yeah. because Paul is a pattern that we're supposed to follow after. But there was a lot more than Paul. And the church at Colossae and the church at Rome are both examples of great churches established outside of Paul's ministry himself. But in Colossians chapter number one, look at verse five. This is 32 years after they were endued with power. The day of Pentecost was the endowment with power. And this is roughly 32 years later. Look at verse five. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have ye have heard before in the word of truth, you've what? You've heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Okay, what is the truth of the gospel that you must hear in order to be saved? That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again from the dead. Those are the components you must believe about Christ's sacrificial offering, his burial, and his resurrection in order to be saved. He said, so that gospel, the word of the truth of that gospel, verse 6, which is come unto you as it is where? In where? In all the world. All right. I'm not a Calvinist. So the word all actually means all. It doesn't have to get redefined. And Paul said the gospel which has come to you as it is in all the world. Okay, where was the scope of the Great Commission? Where were they to go? Go ye therefore into all the world. So by Colossians chapter 1, where had the gospel gone? Now look, I've been reading the Bible for a long time, and it was only a couple years ago that I honed in on that and said, what? Like, like all the world? Like the gospel came to all the world? I mean, did it come to all the Roman world? Did it come to all the Greek world? Did it come to all the known world. And the Lord said, if I wanted to add any clarifications, I would have added it. It said here that it went to all the world. But then it gets even better. Go down to verse number 23. <coughs> verse 23. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have, Heard, 
right? Do you, do you believe that the gospel is something that you must hear? Okay, you can see the creation and it'll tell you there's a God. You can have your inner conscience because God has written on the table of every man's heart some light. So in, in your own inner man and conscience, you can, you can be aware that there's a God, but you cannot be saved by believing in God through creation and conscience. You can only, there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. You have to hear the name Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. So he said, the gospel which ye have heard and which was, past tense, preached to who? Every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am a minister. Now, Paul makes a very, very, very powerful statement. He says, this gospel, which has come unto you, Colossians, has been preached to every creature which is under heaven. Now, if, if I just let the Bible be true, and every man a liar, and I believe what the Bible says, this is what this means. From the day of Pentecost, when they were endued with the power of the Holy Ghost, and they began to fill Jerusalem with their doctrine and move to the rest of the world, 32 years later, when Paul writes to the Colossians, he says, phase one of the Great Commission has been obeyed and completed. Every creature in the entire world has heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I know what your brain's doing right now. Right. I know what your brain's doing. Your brain's doing the same thing my brain was doing when I actually looked at those verses. I'm like, I mean, come, I mean, what about the remote people? I mean, what about, what about America? What about Africa? You know, I, uh, what about India? What about that continent? You know, I was in India um, a year ago in Chennai, India, and when I was there preaching, the pastor took me down to a Catholic church to go see the tomb of St. Thomas. Because Thomas brought the gospel down into India, and he died there in Chennai. And up until Pope John Paul actually took the actual corpse back to Rome, now there's just a mannequin laying in that, in that glass tomb. Uh, but we don't, we don't read about Thomas's journeys down into India, but we know that he was there. We don't read about the Ethiopian eunuch and his exploits once he got down into Africa. But we do have a statement under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost that every person on earth heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Wow. With no real money, technology, modern modes of transportation or communication, with no gospel tracts, by the way, with no New Testament. You understand that the first New Testament epistle, as far as, you know, people debate it, but it appears to me that the first New Testament epistle written was when Paul was in Corinth and wrote a letter to the Thessalonian church well into the second missionary journey. The whole, the whole first missionary journey, they, they preached out of the Old Testament only. He said, that wouldn't work. Well, ask Jesus on the road to Emmaus how well he used the Old Testament to lead those men to Christ. Get to the end of the book of Acts, the very last chapter, and Paul sitting in a hired house, and out of Moses and the Psalms and the prophets, he's expounding the things concerning Christ and the kingdom. Right? So no New Testament yet, no printing presses, no gospel tracts, no none of that. And they got the gospel to the whole world. Now, the statisticians tell us that the world at that time had something like 300 million people. So if you took a church of 700 into a world of 300 million, the ratio, the responsibility of member to the world was 1 to 428,500, roughly. Okay, that, that would mean each of you, if, if you were going to be the church at Jerusalem, I'd have to say to each one of you, you are personally responsible for getting the gospel to 428,500 people. It's, it's impossible. And yet it was done. Now, when I read these verses in Colossians, I'm like, okay, I, I, need, I need a little bit more. I need a little bit more verses to back this up. You know what I'm saying? In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So I started going through the New Testament again, looking for completion statements. I, I wanted statements that were very broad about success and completion of these things. So let's look at a few of them. Uh, let's start in Acts 5.28. Acts chapter 5, verse number 28. 
This is after Peter and John have been arrested the second time. And they said, saying, did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon you. Well, what does that mean when they said ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine? That means in Jerusalem, there was no place that you could go in that city where you were ignorant of the gospel. And what was the doctrine? You filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. Well, they, they were, they'd be working out doctrines for years as, as Paul starts writing. It was the doctrine of Christ. This man whom you have crucified, God has risen from the dead, and we are witnesses of these things. So they had filled Jerusalem. Look at Acts 19. Acts 19, we'll be looking at... Um, Asia more a little bit later, but at Acts 19, Paul is in Ephesus. What an amazing ministry. By the way, this was Paul's longest ministry in any one spot. And he was uh, about two and a half, three and a half years there. But notice what he said this, Acts 19, verse number 10. He had hired um, the school of Tyrannus, um, disputing daily, he, right? He had, a, he had a school room that he rented. Verse 10, it says, and this continued by the space of two years so that, now let's get the word again, all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. How many in Asia heard the word? All. Did all believe? No. A lot did. I mean, there was enough people saved in Asia that the, the guys who were making the, the silversmiths, making the idols, were worried about business because too many people were being converted. But not all were converted, but all heard. Yeah. All they which be in Asia have heard the word of the Lord. Now look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter 1, verse number 5. by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations. And really, that's what that apostleship was about. Apostleship was about obedience to the faith amongst all nations. Verse 7, he says, to all that be in Rome. And then verse 8, he said, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of where? Throughout what part of the world? Okay. Some, something we're going to look at a little bit later, it's going it's to blow your mind away when you see the depth at which each church that was established took personal responsibility for getting the gospel to the whole world. So here's a church at Rome. Paul had never visited this church yet. And yet when Paul, when Paul writes this letter to them, he says to them that your faith is spoken of about the whole world. Now, it wasn't because it was posted on Facebook. How do you think their faith was spoken of about throughout the whole world? Because their church wasn't just growing in Rome. They were distributing their members throughout the whole world because it appears they, like many other churches, actually took the command to preach the gospel to every nation and to all creature as, as though it was a command from God. And they did it. Now look at Romans 15. Romans chapter number 15. This, this verse is just amazing here. Romans chapter number 15 and verse number 18. When you read the Bible, I, I really recommend the, the slow down and chew method. Yeah. Right? Slow down and chew. Like really, really think about what you're reading and pay attention. I, I have been amazed. I've been studying the Bible for 30 years, and I am amazed at how much stuff is right in front of me that I hadn't seen. I'm like, how could I have not seen that? It was right there the whole time. Romans chapter number 15, verse 18. Paul said, for I will dare not to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. Through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Now, there's some things in there you need to pay close attention to. 
Paul said, my, my ministry was to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. And he said, God used mighty signs and wonders and the power of the Holy Spirit so that the gospel was fully preached from Jerusalem to Illyricum. And fully preached doesn't mean any component of it was missing. Fully preached means everywhere I went, it was fully preached to every person that was there. And, and I just want to say this right up front. We'll look at this later. It will require power and miracles to get this job done. Okay? Not, not, not the way you're thinking. Not, not, not. There, there were op- apostolic signs, sure. right, that we don't have. Right. Right? The signs of an apostle accompanied the apostles. They yeah. don't accompany right. us, right? So we don't have those same gifts. But make no mistake at all, completion of this requires dunamis. And dunamis is the intervention of God. It is power given from God to do things far beyond your ability. This job doesn't get done by your strength or your power. Your strength and your power is insufficient. So when God endues us with power from on high for this job, it is miraculous. The doors that need to be open will have to be miraculous doors. It's not going to be a great strategy that you have. It's going to be the power of God. We're going to look at that We're going to look at the Holy Spirit in missions a little bit later on and how that works. But notice now what he said. Verse 20. He said, yea, so I have strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. Now, that does not mean Paul would not go where Christ was already named. Because in just a minute, he's going to say to the Romans, I'm finally ready to come, spend some time with you, bear some fruit with you, and then you can get me on to Spain, Paul would go down to Jerusalem. Paul would often go where the brethren were. But he said, what I strove to do was to preach where Christ was not named. Because where were they commanded to preach the gospel? To to every creature. And then in verse 23, he says, but now, having no more place in these parts, And having a great desire these many years to come unto you, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way thitherward, et cetera, et cetera. But notice he said this. He said, he said, in these places, he said, there are, there is no more place in these parts. What does he mean, these parts? Well, earlier he said in verse 19 from Jerusalem, roundabout unto Illyricum. He said, in these places, there is no place left in these places where Christ has not been named. I have fully preached the gospel. I have looked for where Christ has not been named. I have been hindered from coming to Rome. I've wanted to come many years, but not until I could say, in these places here, there is no spot left where Christ has not been named. So I've got a picture. I want to show you Jerusalem to Illyricum. If the guys can put it up. I would strongly suggest that you look at your maps when you read the Bible. They will change everything. So Jerusalem, all right, this is where the gospel began. And the gospel goes up. Antioch is up in here. This is kind of the realm of the first missionary journey. The second missionary journey gets over here into Macedonia and these areas. Um, You get over into Italy. Here's Rome, all right? This is all Asia in here. So Paul says, all Asia has heard the word of the Lord. Jerusalem is filled. But he says, from Jerusalem, roundabout unto Illyricum, that's really the uh, realm of Paul's first, second, and third missionary journeys. And what does he say? I can now in a good conscience, I can leave this area because there is no place left where Christ has not been named. So now I'm ready to come to Rome. See that? But he says, I'm not going to stay in Rome. He says, I want to have a little bit of fruit amongst you. And then you are going to get, you are going to carry me on my journey. Yep. Basically, you're going to pay yep. to get me, yep. which we see this is why churches fund missions. They get the missionaries to different spots. So he's going to stop over in Rome and then he's going to carry on to Spain. No place left in these parts. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. That's really convicting. I mean, that's, that's really, really deeply convicting because I would say that the average missionary would pick a city in one of those places or might pick a little region like Greece and they might spend their entire life in one 
spot and not fully preach the gospel, let alone covering. This is, this is Cappadocia and Pontus and Phrygia and Galatia and Asia and all of Macedonia. Now on to Rome and the rest of the world. <clears throat> all right, so now this is the question that I need to ask you. Does, does, it, does it feel somewhat impossible? A little church in Jerusalem of 700 people I would say just covering Jerusalem to Illyricum, we could say, well done, church. But they didn't. They went to the whole world. So let's talk a little bit of math. Because I want to ask you why the 7 billion people in our generation, why is it that I can't write right now? How come I can't say honestly to you uh, that from there to there, the gospel has fully been preached? It's, it's not. You say, but we have a big world. We have 7 billion people. Oh, okay. Well, there are in America, if we took just our little family of independent Baptists, there are, there are at least 10,000 independent Baptist churches in America. Some say 14,000, but there's at least 10,000 churches. The average size is 70, right? So you're, you're looking at 700,000 independent Baptists in America. If, if we could say that's our team to start with, right? The world today, well, it was last year 7 billion. I hear it's 8 billion now, but it's going to mess my mouth up. So or it's just going to say that the earth is still 7 billion. If we had 700,000 independent Baptists in a world of 7 billion, do you know what that ratio is? That's 1 to 10,000. If our ratio was 1 to 42,000, we would only have 10% responsibility as to what they had. But we're, we, we have like a 2%. We, we have something like we only have to do... 2% of what they had to do if you take our starting point. And, oh, we have really cool things like the whole Bible. <laughs> Gospel tracts, John and Romans, airplanes. Like, like, I was in Fiji yesterday, and I am here today. Like, I was preaching in Fiji a couple days ago, and now I'm preaching here. So we have all this technology. We have money. We have resources. We have the internet. I've, I've been using some of our internet technology. We, we've planted a church in Zambia, in Africa. I'm working with 43 national pastors in uh, about three hours north of Chennai. Once a month, I gather these 43 preachers, sometimes under a mango tree, and they're with somebody's phone and my phone and the earbuds. I preach and teach and they translate. Like we don't even have to physically get up and go places if we touch the technology that we have. So we have an incredible amount of technology. We have an incredible amount of wealth. We have an, and by the way, that's just one to 10,000 would be just taking us. Do you know in the Philippines in 1950, there were zero independent Baptist churches. Do you know how many there are in the Philippines today? About 25,000. So if we added them, and they're doing a much better job about going to the world than we are, to tell the truth. But if we added them to the equation, our ratio might only be one to a thousand. And then if we added, like, other non-Baptists who actually preach the gospel, we might be down to one to five hundred. Like, like, literally, the job that we need to get done is so small in comparison. And yet, according to JoshuaProject.net, there are at least 3 billion people on the world today that will live and die and never hear the name Jesus. Okay, whose fault is this? Like, who's, whose fault is it? Well, when I read this, I said, this is my fault. Because I can't blame anybody. Because the way I understand God is God doesn't save by many or by few. Like, he can cut 30,000 armies down to 300 and still whip the enemy, right? So God is not constrained to save by many or few. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro on the, all, the, all the world, looking for someone to show himself strong. I sought for a man to stand in the gap, but I found none. Like God's never looking for huge numbers to get the job done. He's looking for anybody that will believe him. So I have to say, first of all, it is my responsibility that the world is this way. This, this is my fault. I'm one of the people of the world today. I'm a born-again believer, so I'm responsible for this. It's my fault. And then whose responsibility is it to change it? Because let me tell you, I am tired of hearing Baptists sit around and talk about the problem, and nobody's got like, well, what can we do about it? You know, we just got to leave it the way it is. No, no, no. We have to find out why we are this way. It doesn't do any good to have the truth. Now, one last statement, if we can't spread it. A good friend of mine, 
Um, over, over the last five years, God has, God has put people in my path over the last couple of years that had little pieces to this puzzle that I was, that I was missing. I, I have been blessed. I asked God, show me where they are, Lord. Surely somebody's got some components. Oh, believe me, they're there. And this one good brother, he said to me, he said, you know, Brother Maris, he said, we have sacrificed the Great Commission for doctrinally sound churches. Yeah. I'm like, I don't think I like that. Because I'm a missionary. I planted churches. And my goal was to leave behind doctrinally sound churches. Churches that could stand on their own two feet and withstand all the attacks of the, the enemy. I wanted a multi-generational church that would keep on going. The, the, and, and, and he said, yes. And he said, but you know what we've done is we've, we've focused so much on that. We've left so much of the world unreached. And, and you'll see as we go through the biblical principles, it's a little bit scary. Because Paul left baby churches behind. Did you ever notice that? Did you, did you ever notice that Paul left behind Baby churches. Yeah. And I'm like, well, we can't do that. We have, we have so many cults in the world today. If we did that, they'd all get swallowed up right away. And he's like, oh, Paul had the same problem, like missionaries being unsent, but went out of the church at Jerusalem. Everywhere Paul preached, they showed up and said, by the way, if you don't keep the law of Moses and be circumcised, you can't be saved. Like he had to go deal with the wolves coming right in and spoil. Oh, same problems. But, but we'll leave all that because we're going we're gonna to talk about all that. As all this unfolds, we're going to talk about all of that. But here's where I want to end this right now. I came to the conclusion that it is the will of God that every human being on earth hear the gospel. And now looking at it was commanded by God. It was demonstrated for us in the Bible. And we are told it was completed. So now I know it can be done. And it seems to me that the will of God would be that every, every generation preaches the gospel to every creature, that it has to be redone every generation because new people are born. Some people didn't believe the first time that they heard it. So every generation's responsibility is to get the gospel to the whole world, and I'll leave your church with just this. What if you were the only church now? Let, let's say that you are the church at Jerusalem. You have nobody else on earth. Faith Baptist Church in Bakersfield, you as a church family right now have been given this commission to reach the entire world. And if you don't do it, it won't get done. You, you can't support other missionaries because let's say, what if there were no other missionaries? Right. Okay, so you increased your budget and you took on another missionary. What if there were no missionaries? What if the salvation of the whole world depended on what this church alone did? Would the world be safe in your hands? Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the introduction. God, may each one of us accept the fact that the Great Commission is a mandate, and I have to complete it. In Christ's name, amen.